Today I am here with Grace Draven. How are you today? I am very good. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. I have so many questions for you. Um, and we were just discussing before, so we might as well get straight into it. What is it like living in Texas, USA? Uh, well, depending upon where you're at, because Texas is a ginormous state, not as big as Alaska, but quite large. Um, and depending upon where you're at, uh, it can actually have four seasons of the year. But for the most part, where I am from, or not where I've lived for a very long time, I'm actually originally from Louisiana, but I've lived in Texas for a very long time. Uh, it's usually just hot. It's summer, it feels like all year round, because um, I was until very recently living in Houston. So it's like, I think we get three days of winter and we might get two weeks of fall, two weeks of spring, and all the rest of the time is summer, hot, humid, wet summer. <laughs> did you, did I see recently that you guys got snow? Uh, in this area, yes. I have moved just a little south of Austin in what's known as the Texas Hill Country, and we actually did have snow. Um, it was great and surprising. I think since I have lived in the southern United States all of my life, I think I've seen snow. I can count on the number on all 10 fingers with fingers left over the number of times I've seen snow. So that was really awesome. And of course, the weather swings differently here as well. So I think two days ago, we got up to 84 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not really sure what that translates into Celsius, but we had the AC running. Oh. Yeah. And then we had the heat going the next day. <laughs> yes, very. So you're never quite sure. I think I saw a meme one time where it showed nature says, you can't have four seasons in a week and Texas says, hold my beer. So that's probably about right. Let's take it to the start. Let's start talking about your writing journey and your books. Where did okay. it start for you? What, what made you want to write in the first place and what made you decide let's publish a book? Let's see. I would probably say back in 2003, I started picking it up as a hobby and a stress reliever. Uh, I had two little kids both of them under the age of four at home. I worked a job that was well over 40 hours a week. And I was a financial analyst and an audit coordinator. So I dealt with taxes and I needed something to sort of, I guess, you know, that helped me relax, but still sort of exercise that creative muscle. And I sure wasn't getting it with number crunching and reconciliations. Yes. Yeah, so I wrote fan fiction and so I wrote for different universes and it was just a matter of fun and blowing off some steam and I had a really good time with it. And then in 2005, I entered a contest in a small uh, digital publishing house and I was one of 10 people who won. So I got a contract with them and I published my first short story with them and that was The King of Hell. And then after that, I mean, it, my royalties on it would have paid for a Starbucks coffee. So you know, but then after that, I just continued to write and I would publish here and there. But obviously, I wasn't doing it full time. And uh, probably, I think it was and then I stopped writing actually for a couple of years. And then I decided to self publish in 2011. I think that's when it really took off for me. And by 2015, I was doing it full time. How did you find yeah. entering into the indie publishing world because I know a lot of authors usually have a lot of hiccups on the way as they're trying to learn everything and what's involved with it so what were your biggest sort of ups and successes I actually loved it I loved the idea of uh, spinning all those plates at one time I really didn't have an issue with it although I totally understand why other authors uh, might think of it as being more of a a pain to do that when you want to be able to spend all your energy writing the book you really don't want to have to deal with all these other admin and promotional and marketing tasks that you have to do and there are a lot to do and it actually I think has increased over time uh, but I didn't have an issue with it I really enjoyed it as far as challenges go I would probably say since I'm not technically savvy at all but I think that was probably one of the toughest things with it I didn't have a problem with the tax portion of it, doing tax reporting and stuff, because I was very used to that. That's what I did for years. So what I find absolutely amazing about your journey as well is that you indie publish, but then you also traditionally publish. So you are um, with Ace, who is a extend, uh, extension of Penguin House, I believe. How did Correct. you find 
the different process I guess after having sort of self-taught you're like learning the ways onto publishing and then having somebody else handle majority of it what what would you say the two biggest differences were in that and what was it like for you when you realized you'd been approved and accepted for a traditional publisher ah well let's see as far as um the differences between them obviously your main job uh as, or you actually have two main jobs, in my opinion, or at least from my experience with traditional publishing. And that is complete your book by the deadline given to you and what's cited in your contract, of which I suck at really bad. Um, and <laughs> I've had to have a few amendments and addendums coming in with contracts because I have been late on my original deadlines every time. I'm so sorry, Penguin. And um, <laughs> uh, the other thing is probably you don't really have much input in the book packaging overall in comparison to self-publishing where you are literally running the show. You are captaining that ship, you know, of course, which means you've, you will reap the benefits and pay for all the mistakes. You know, that is all on you uh, with traditional publishing uh, distribution and things like that, um, marketing and so forth, they may ask you to help them promote and to market and so forth, but they're the ones that are really handling all of that. They take care of pricing. You know, they're the ones who determine that. They are the ones who will select the artist and so forth, and they will do the cover. They might get a little bit of input from you, but typically you are outside of those decision-making processes regarding book packaging um, with obviously self-publishing, you were into it up to your eyeballs. So those are the two biggest differences. How did you obtain your contract with Penguin? Did you go directly or did you have an agent? What was the process for you like basically um, obtaining that contract and, and why did you want it in the first place? Did you sort of just want to see what it was like other side to compare? Uh, well, let's see. Originally, when I first started writing uh, professionally, and I am going to term that by saying writing to get paid, you know, then that's really what it is for me. You know, I consider if you're writing professionally, you're getting paid to write. Um, I was with that small digital publisher. And for the most part, they handled pretty much the same thing that the bigger traditional publishers like Penguin and so forth. Um, do same processes and so forth. You really didn't have a whole lot of input. You know, you were assigned an editor and there was somebody who did your cover for you and so forth. So I was, I understood and I had dealt with that process before. And one of the reasons I went to self-publishing was that I actually wanted more control over that. You know, I had gotten some questionable uh, book covers that I just didn't care for. And I felt that had a huge, um, disadvantage as far as trying to sell units and I felt that the numbers bore that out so I went to self-publishing uh, changed up covers controlled pricing differently and uh, did a lot better what I wanted to do with the traditional publishing was to sort of break through an invisible ceiling a glass ceiling to try to reach other audiences that only do read traditionally published books or and of course, this was during a time frame when self-publishing in this particular arena was just really starting out because in 2011 was when I jumped on board and it was great. Um, but at the same time, it, traditional publishing was still the holy grail of a lot of you know publishing options and so forth. Really, that was the big fish you wanted to catch. So probably in 2016, I think it was, or 2017, sorry, the years and the days go by really fast. Uh, I had heard that um, my agent really liked my work. And so um, I got in touch with her through um, another author, Jeffy Kennedy. And Jeffy and I actually share the same agent. And I spoke with her. Her name is Sarah. And she's with the uh, Nancy Yost Literary Agency. And we spoke. And she had asked me. Originally, it was just for foreign and sub rights is what I wanted to work with her on. And then she said, well, if you have anything you want to submit, let me know. And we could start work on that. So that's when I was like, well, you know, actually I do have something. So <clears throat> I sent her the first three chapters of Phoenix Unbound and she put it out on the uh, submission trail and uh, Penguin came in with a bid wow. and that's how it got started. That's amazing. Congratulations. I know Thank that you. was four years ago, but that must have been super exciting. Just taking more elevating steps as you were building your platform and your voice in the, in the writing community. That's amazing. 
And, you know, I think it was really something that was one thing I wanted to do. I think you brought it up and um, coined it in the perfect ways to build your platform. And that's really something that I wanted to do is build my platform. The way I work is probably not conducive to traditional publishing protocol, just because once again, I'm missing deadlines and all this other stuff. And they're a little bit more rigid in that kind of thing than what you are in self-publishing because you set your own deadlines unless you're putting out pre-orders, you know, for Amazon. And I rushed to try and meet those too. Um, so, but at the same time, it taught me a lot also being, and being able to have a comparison between traditional publishing and self-publishing. I felt like I had a really good sense of, you know, how it, the grass is not always greener on either side. It's just different shades in certain patches of the yard. So, you know, that was really a good experience for me. I think it gave me a sense of how I wanted to also refine my self-publishing. So, yeah, being a hybrid author has been really good. Well, I absolutely love this because, like, here we're hearing – You've had like basically 18 years of experience in writing. You started your writing in 2003 and then went to 2011 to do it more professionally. And it just shows what can happen in like, you know, I think a lot of people try and focus on being an overnight success or hitting it like within a year. And it's, it's never, for some, it might be like that, but you need to hear the realistic stories of as long as you're like dedicated and you're writing and you're bringing more quality books that it is a gradual process, but you get there. I always tell people, it's like, yeah, it took me 10 years um, to become an overnight success kind of thing, because in a way it was sort of overnight because it was like my third full length novel that really hit big, hit hard. And after that, it was, you know, something that I could really uh, try, hopefully keep the pace up going. But yeah, it was 10 years. It was 10 years of trying to learn and refine my craft. Now, obviously I'm very behind on the whole marketing knowledge and so forth because I do need to work on that a little bit more but then again there's only one of me and there's limited hours in the day and I have to make the decision as well as to whether or not how much time I want to spend on refining my skills and how much on marketing because I think that just makes that makes a difference and I'm in it for the long haul and the long tail as much as I would like to be an overnight success that lasts for the next 20 years, I don't think that's how it's really going to work. I need to be in this for a long time. So that does mean I have to continue to increase my skill levels and my writing chops so that I can stay in the game for as long as possible. I want to talk about your Wraith King series because I want to say I think that's one of your most popular, like obviously all of them are very popular, yes. but uh, the Wraith Kings is very prominent when you come onto your pages. And that's so very true. I want to I wanna talk about that series. What what gave you the inspiration for it? And how how did you receive feedback, I guess, when it first came out? How was that for you? That was actually quite a stunning surprise, to be honest, and totally unexpected because it was not supposed to be a six-book series. It was actually starting out, Radiance was going to be a short story, no more than 12,000 words, that I was offering for free on my brand new website, which Alona Andrews had designed for me. And so I wanted to try and drive traffic to it so that I have people visit. Um, and then when I told my editor, who I very fondly call evil editor Mel, and that's uh, she's fellow author um, Mel Sterling. She had, when I said, it's going to be a short story. And she was like, are you sure? And then I came back to her a little bit later and I said, well, it's a novella. And she's like, mm, okay. And then I came back to her again. I was like, it's a novel. And then after, she, you know, she and my first other erstwhile editor, Laura, had uh, gone ahead and edited and it was out in the wild and so forth. I was like, well, there's a second book. And of course, Mel was laughing. And then after that, I was like, it's a six book series. And so <laughs> that is how, yeah, it definitely sort of graduated away from its original intention, to say the least. I want to know, so your third one, um, Ipos King, has only recently just come out. This was last year, yes. but you actually had delays in its release because you had issues with pirating, didn't you? What was... Well, unfortunately, that's not unique. Lots of people have issues with, uh, you know, pirating. It seems to just be one of those plagues that attach to all of us. What had happened was I had uh, stopped. I was originally going to serialize the rough draft on my website, but 
I chose instead to stop that because when I did the same for Radiance, I actually had some serious issues with Amazon trying to get the story uploaded because several people, whoever had visited, <clears throat> had taken all the chapters of the rough draft, aggregated them into a PDF file and stuck them out on every, P you know, on every pirating site that you can imagine. And at the time, Amazon hadn't quite gotten a handle on how pirating worked as far as that went. And so they came back to me multiple times with various things such as you need to prove copyright. This is not a problem. I register all my books. So I had everything available to them, but it was, you had to prove copyright. And then I had to tell them that no, I was not in violation of terms of service because they have a thing out there that says, if you're going to charge this amount of money on Amazon, why is somebody else here showing it for free? I'm like, it's a pirate site. They don't have authorization. And a lot of that is bot driven on Amazon. And so once you can finally get your hands on a warm body to talk to, you know, they can usually get it fixed or taken care of. But when you're talking about a lot of, you know, timing concerns and issues. Luckily, I didn't have anything up for pre-order or that would have been a mess. So I chose at that point, you know, it, it's one of those ones where they say, we, this is why we can't have nice things. There you go. Yeah. So the other thing where the Epos King was uh, delayed multiple times was I had issues in uh, my family. My dad was originally diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's and then re-diagnosed with a brain tumor. And then luckily it was uh, benign. They got that taken care of. My husband had busted up his ankle really bad on a motorized skateboard. And so I was like, dude, you are too old to be doing this kind of thing. And ended up with three screws and a plate in his leg. So in three months of convalescence at home, my principal editor, Laura Gasway, passed away in 2016 unexpectedly. And multiple non-compete clauses in my Fallen Empire trilogy with Penguin. So a combination of all those things uh, delayed the release of the Epos King significantly. So yeah, it, it's been a wild ride for the Epos King. <laughs> that's that's a lot. And that's, that just like stands to show though who you are as a person, like to obviously persevere through all of that, but still continue and just say it's okay just because I'm not focusing on this now and it's delayed, it doesn't won't get to it and then you still jump on board and you've had so many hurdles with this book and yet here it is it's available guys <laughs> grab it a lot of blood sweat and tears went into that book so wow and, and, uh, yeah I was so happy to get it out the door now granted I dropped it onto my editor's desk at the last minute and my proofer's desk at the last minute when we did one small delay on the pre-order because Amazon now allows that you can have I forgot how many weeks up two weeks I think it is if you need to delay that so we were doing that we were in a complete state of panic from you know the moment it dropped onto their desk until it actually went live so what book was it for you that because you are a usa bestseller which is an amazing feat so congratulations thank you what, what book or books i'm assuming got you on that list and what did you do when you found out how did you find out how did you celebrate Oh, that's funny. Um, Radiance was the first one to hit um, the bestseller list and which I was stunned and I didn't even know about it until it was another author um, who sent me an email. I don't remember if it was Jeffy Kennedy or Elizabeth Hunter. Uh, so sorry, guys, if you're reading this I don't, or hearing this, I don't remember which one of you told me, but they said, you realize you hit the bestseller list. And I said, what? <laughs> so I went out to look. I couldn't believe it. I was stunned. Um, so Radiance hit, which I thought, wonderful. Now I can, you know, put this on my cover and so forth. I got bragging rights. And then uh, the following year, uh, Idolan hit, which was fantastic. And then when Phoenix Unbound came out, it hit. And uh, Dragon Unleashed hit. The Epos King hit. So I can definitely at least say I'm not a one-off. You know, that this was not one of those one hit wonder things. So yay. <laughs> I, I love so much too that you got on that list first as an indie author that Correct. Unbound was, I think your, your third or fourth one you said, and that's with the traditional publisher. And I know that there is a lot of stigma and obviously traditional publishers can put more money into the marketing. And there's a team that know what they're doing. So the fact that you got on there 
like by yourself it's just amazing I'm so inspired congratulations that's amazing oh thank you very much I was absolutely shocked and like you I'm just thrilled that three out of the five books that hit were indie published amazing. so which um, and you know I didn't know about, especially like with Radiance, I didn't know about the whole thing. If you release on this day, then it gives you a better chance of hitting the USA Today bestseller list. And in fact, it didn't hit the first week that it was out. It hit like the third or fourth week that it was out. So it really was word of mouth and it just sort of sped up and steamrolled and so forth. So yeah, it wasn't its release week that it hit the USA Today bestseller list. I think it was nearly a month later. What would you say that perhaps your focus are when you release a book or maybe more specifically that book, was there anything different that you trialed or you just, you went through the same process that you usually do for releases and that book was the one that just went boom for you? You know, I think for Radiance, it probably helped that I did have somewhat of an established audience. Granted, it was smaller and everything, but people started following the rough draft serialization of Radiance. So I think when, you know, it finally went live with the final that I had people ready and willing to buy, not to mention that I got a great shout out from Alona Andrews and that's going to be, uh, that's, that's big. So <laughs> I think that was a huge help as well. Thank you, Alona. <laughs> <laughs> what does your day to day look, uh, look like? What is your, your daily routine? What's the magic formula for you? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't really have one. I am one of those authors. I mean, I guess some people would say, you know, it's organic. That's a nice way of saying it's incredibly disorganized. I really do not know when I get up in the morning how I'm going to handle that particular day's task. I do have sort of like a loose task list on the side that I continuously update. So I mark through what, you know, I've I did for that day. So I may take 10 things off, but I add another 13 back on and things get switched around. It's not unusual for me to say, well, today I just did not write because I had to do all these other things. So um, a lot of times you, you always hear the uh, principle of hands on keyboard, button chair. And that absolutely is true. It's just for me, it's not sort of like, okay, so I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going I've lost you again. How's that? You'd be so ready to sacrifice this laptop once you're done. You'd just be like, I'm done. <laughs> I am. I'm so tempted at this point to go out to the garage and get a sledgehammer on this thing. So. <laughs> I, I don't think it liked hearing that. <laughs> I can't hear you. I think you're right. It's paying me back for threatening it. <laughs> He loved the laptop. He won with the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, my disorganized day. Um, I wish I could say that, you know, I get up, I work from nine to five. I try to get in this minimum amount of word count and so forth. It's like, nope, it's, I'm doing 20,000 other different things and I might write 500 words at nine o'clock. I might get back up. I'm a night owl too. So it might be three o'clock in the morning and I'll do 1600 words or whatever. If I'm in a time crunch, and writing, then I can do 5,000 words a day. And I usually, I hand write all my books and then transcribe them, so. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow, I think you are actually the first author I've interviewed that writes, like, wow, how are your hands? Does that not hurt? I don't know if that makes me sound Yes, <laughs> it does. No, it really does hurt. Um, I was trying to get a huge amount of word count in in a short period of time for Raven Unveiled, which is the third book in the Fallen Empire trilogy, because I had already passed like three deadlines and my editor's like, so would you ever like to turn that book in? And my agent was like, is it done? So I was like, I'm working on it. And so I was like putting in five to 6,000 words a day and for about a solid week. And by the end, I told my agent, I said, I have got to take a break. I said, I have my hand iced down right now. So, but wow. yeah. And is that just you, have you tried before to like go straight to the laptop and it just doesn't flow organically for you that way? It has to be pen to paper. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, I am a much faster typist than I am at handwriting. So, but for some reason from the creative standpoint or just being able to, like you say, you know, get into the flow and crank out the word count. 
I, it's much more productive doing it by hand, even though obviously I'm slower at it. I can still put way out, way more word count out than whenever I'm just typing it directly. I kind of love that though. I feel like it's so authentic in a way. Like it's really, it's really nice. I credit to you. I could never do that. I can't even write in my journal like two minutes and I'm like, (laughs) so credit to you. Thank you. It does get to you after a while. And of course, I think I'm the only one that can read my terrible penmanship. And even then, sometimes I can't read it and I have to look at it and think, what was I trying to say? And I think there was one time when I had one of my notebooks out for Dragon Unleashed and we had a Alona Andrews over for dinner. And that's a, that's a husband and wife team. That's a Alona and Gordon. And I know Gordon had picked up my notebook and he was flipping through it. I said, yeah, that's me. Um, that's my uh, working copy for Dragon Unleashed. And he flipped through it and you could tell he's like, I can't read any of this. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I said, I don't even have to write it in code. Nobody's going to be able to read that. So <laughs> that's amazing. What would you say your favorite book to write has been so far and why? Intrigue me. Okay. Probably my Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, my Beauty and the Beast uh, retelling Intrigue me. Just because I love the original story so much and I'd always wanted to write a retelling of it. And I just loved working in that world and I thoroughly loved the heroine and the hero too, but the heroine for sure. She was my favorite to write. Do you do a lot of signings and events? No, I don't. Um, And it's not because I worry or have any kind of stage fright. I really don't. Um, Most of the time I do have to limit a lot of my attendance to conferences and so forth because they tend to be out of state. And to be frank, it's budgetary. I mean, I just don't have this limitless well of you know money to be able to spend on these conferences, which can be very expensive. I love going to them. I love chatting with people and so forth. But typically, if I'm going to do one that is, you know, requires me to either drive a long way or fly and stay in a hotel and all that other good stuff, uh, I have to limit it to maybe two conferences. Even more so now, I just had to cancel um a trip that was scheduled originally it was supposed to be for the rare event and that's reader or romance author reader event is what it's called that was going to take place in edinburgh scotland and of course covid caused them to you know postpone it and then they postponed it to 2022 but since then you know going out of the country is not even viable for us anymore because we don't have the caretaker we need for my son who's autistic and then I've got elderly in-laws that you know need some help. But I'm hoping to attend, you know, at least some of the more local stuff if I can once everything opens back up. Amazing. What has been your most memorable reader interaction? No, oh, yeah, I've had there's a lot. Um, and like I said, I really enjoy the reader interaction and so forth because you can just the passion in these readers for the books that they read and they can cite back to you details in your book that you've forgotten. And they're like, Oh, I love so-and-so. And I love this one scene. And boy, and you're like, I don't remember that scene. I wrote that. <laughs> Cause you're writing so many words. You have so many characters and scenes. You have to actually sit there and think for a moment. Oh yeah. And I wrote that nine years ago. So, but it's thrilling that they remember it. And, you know, it's in, because that tells me that it's imprinted this really strong image in their head and has resonated with them, which I think is great. But reader interaction, yes. I was at the Romantic Times convention um, in 2016, and that was, no, 2015. I was there in 2015. And Entreat Me had uh, won the... Uh, best fantasy romance for 2014, but they were, you know, giving out the awards on the 2015 uh, conference. So while I was there with my husband, we were at one of the like evening events where, you know, they were serving food and there was dancing and all this other stuff. And they were, you know, having their meal. And then we asked them, we were like, can we sit here? And they said, sure. You know, like, who are these weirdos? But they were very nice. And so we sat down and I started the conversation with them, which is like, so, you know, are you here as readers? Are you authors? And what's your favorite genres and stuff like that? Because I mean, we're all there for books, so it should be pretty easy to, you know, have a conversation with people. So then they started telling us about it and they're like, well, what do you write? And I said, well, um, I write fantasy romance. I said, one of my novels is Master of Crows. 
And one of them stopped and I saw her, you know, her face she sort of frowned a little. She's like, wait, I read that. Oh my God, I love that book. And so <laughs> it, it turned into this really, you know, very uh, you know, exciting conversation, not really just about my book that just sort of broke the ice kind of thing. And then we just got going after that. And then they came to see me at the signing event the next day. It was just awesome. I love when you have small <laughs> instances like that. It's the ones that you sort of least expect, or it, it takes you just, it grabs you out of nowhere. And you have one of those moments where you inhale and you're like, wow, this is real. This is what I do for a living. And people love it as well. They love it as much as me. That's amazing. Absolutely. And you said it was, it was just serendipitous and totally unexpected. And I think that's probably why I remember it the most. Um, Cause I guess that I've had lots of wonderful reader interactions that provide great memories, but that one really stuck out because of that. What would you say for fellow writers who are watching um, or fellow writers and authors, what would you say your top three marketing tips are? No. <laughs> I love that as we discussed that your left is like absolutely not <laughs> it's almost like I ran away and said I don't want to answer that <laughs> I'm your like good laptop, good laptop. <laughs> right <laughs> uh top three marketing tips I would because like I said I'm not the world's best marketer uh, but I would probably say um be sincere in your social media okay you know, readers want to be able to interact with you to some level of degree, and you want to be sincere, okay? It doesn't mean you have to open a vein, you know, and overshare, because honestly, they don't want to hear all that either. Um, but you do want them to get some insight into you as a person. They don't want to be constantly marketed to read my book, read my book, read my book. If they're there, they're reading your book. And they just want to be able to, you know, learn a little bit more about you. And it isn't even necessarily about you personally. It can be about your book writing process or anything like that. But the main thing is to be sincere and, you know, don't constantly treat your reader as, you know, oh, that's a potential sale kind of thing because they're a person too. You know, if you want to be seen as a person, you treat them as a person. So I think that's one of the best marketing things at all is respect your reader. Um, I would probably say second marketing, I think we have a really good cover. And not only a good cover, but a cover that brands what you write. So uh, that doesn't just mean this beautiful cover that everybody loves. It has to be a beautiful cover for what you're doing. So for me, since I write fantasy romance, I know that fantasy leans toward um, illustrative work and less manipulated stock although that is becoming a little bit more popular. So I've always selected artists um, who do illustration for me, paintings and so forth, because I think that brands fantasy romance because of the fantasy aspect of it. If I did contemporary, then I would probably go more with manipulated stock photos just because I think that fits that brand more. So I think you have to be aware of your brand. So I think that's really important. Third one is for marketing, write a good book. If you're going to spend a ton of time on your marketing, you need to support it with the product that you are marketing. And that is, it needs to be a solid product. So spend your time on your craft and write a good book. That's my three. And for all I know, take that with a grain of salt. I could be dead wrong. <laughs> well, what you're doing is right. You're, you're to show for that. So I think the great tips. If, if you weren't doing writing for time, what you're doing now, what else do you think you would be doing? Like, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did I want to be when I grew up? Well, that just depends. If you were asking, like, what stage of my life? Because when I was a teenager, mm, I think, what did I want to do? I wanted to travel the country as the equivalent of a deadhead, you know, the Grateful Dead fans, only I wanted to be a Rush fan and just travel all over the country and go to Rush concerts. And I was okay with living in a tent on the street or whatever, as long as I could go see Rush concerts. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that's changed over time. <laughs> um and of course, much to my dad's relief, because I think he was really a little concerned with my future goals. <laughs> um, what would I be doing if I wasn't writing? Well, I'm fairly stoic about that kind of thing. I'm pretty pragmatic. 
probably the same thing I was doing before I was able to do the writing full time. And that is some kind of accounting work or whatever. It just because, you know, I got bills to pay and mouths to feed and that kind of thing. So yeah, I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate uh, in that I have moved into a, a role where I do what I love and I get paid for it. And that's actually a combination that's pretty rare. So I'm very grateful and very happy to have that land in my lap. It was a lot of work, you know, but to be able to, it was worth every bit of it if this is what it came to. This is my favorite question to ask. What is your largest goal? What is the dream that you're chasing for your author career? Well, well you know, I, I feel like I've hit some goals that I just never expected to hit, which I'm just totally thankful. And I say that because I worked uh, for five years in a Walden Books as a bookseller when uh, I was in college. That's how I paid my way through school. And I remember, you know, shelving the names of all these, you know, super popular authors. And we did book signings and stuff like that. And thought, wow, this is just so amazing. This amazing job that these people had. It must be an absolute dream to be able to do this. And then so many years later, you know, I'm a lot more ancient than I was then, but to um, be able to be doing that now, because I was, I was in my early twenties when I worked um, in that book. So I was like 18, 19, 20 and 21. I was there for five years. And uh, you know, now that I'm like I'm almost 54. <laughs> uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Wow, you look really good for your age. Oh my God, bless you, my darling. Thank you. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, well done. <laughs> I don't know. If Thank that's you. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so, yeah. you know, as far as that goes, it was you know, as a goal. You know, honestly, my goal is to just stick with this. I, I was, I guess, I don't want to say I have small dreams because I don't, but I've been able to achieve something wonderful by doing this. Uh, one of the great things that happened from being able to do this was that my husband was able to retire from this horrible job. One of the big goals that was met was to be able to bring in enough money so that, you know, he was able to quit that job and not die, you know, <clears throat> just from, you know, the stress of that. So that was wonderful. So honestly, my long-term big time goal is to continue with something like that, to do what I love and be able to help my family also achieve their own dreams, you know, pays for my daughter's school, pays for my other one too, you know, she goes to choir and things like that. So, you know, pretty day-to-day -day mundane things, but they're important to us, which I think is, you know, what you have to sort of look at too. You know, there's a lot of pie in the sky, awesome stuff. I mean, if my agent came to me and said, hey, somebody wants the movie rights to one of your books, I wouldn't be like, oh no, that's fine. I'd be like, oh, yeah, let's do this. So, but yeah. I love how much like, like how grateful you are as well. You're so humble and grateful for everything that you've received, but still ambitious to go, but there's still so much more I can obtain. I find it really inspiring to listen to. Um, what What is coming up for you? What should we be on the lookout for? Well, 2021, I don't want to say I set New Year's resolutions because I inevitably break those. So my goal <laughs> right now is to be more organized um, and what I would like to do, of course, this is all dependent on some of the things that are happening with um, uh, the third book that went to Penguin, and that was Raven Unveiled. I haven't yet heard uh, back from them when they want to put it on the schedule, because I know that with COVID, that just blew their schedules out of the water. They had to rearrange a whole bunch of stuff that was already in the pipeline. So new stuff coming in, which would have been mine. I don't know where they're sitting with that at the moment. And I turned in Raven Unveil right before the Christmas break for publishing. So, you know, I'm sure my editor didn't even look at it until she got back, which is fine by me because I was really, really burnt out at, on writing <laughs> at that point. So um, I have for 2021, two, possibly three anthologies that I'll be in. Uh, the fourth book in the Wraith King series, which is the Nomas King. And Nomas means nomad. Oh, and for anybody who's asking, Ippos means horse. So he, Saravek was the horse king. Uh, and then let's see, so the Nomas King, the two, possibly three anthologies, 
And then I've got, I'm working on it right now. Um, I'm going to do a science fiction novella, science fiction romance novella under the pen name Anne Sparrow. Okay. Have you done work previously under Anne Sparrow? No, this would be the first time. So, and I had thought originally of doing it as Grace Draven, but I think I just need to, after uh, attending a really good conference that talked about branding and so forth, I didn't want to confuse my fantasy romance readers. And while I would love to have, you know, 100% crossover, that's just not going to happen. Um, and I did want to keep some clear delineation between the science fiction romance and the fantasy romance. Grace Draven is known for fantasy romance. And so it's almost like starting over with the science fiction romance, but that's okay. I mean, I don't mind, you know, I just going to have to work a lot harder trying to get the name out. So yes, my uh, story is called Silk and it's the first of at least two books um, in the Saren Garrel Gate cycle. So it's uh, and it's by Anne Sparrow. I'm excited for that. And when are we, do you roughly know when that one will be releasing or, or watch your space? I'm shooting, I'm shooting for late spring Ooh. of this year. Exciting. Have you started the cover yet? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact. Um, Isis D'Souza, who is the uh, illustrator for the Radiance and Idolan book covers, and also for the Undying King, she is working on the uh, cover for Silk right now. That's so exciting. Yeah, it is. It's like, can't wait to see it. All right. So at the end, I've started a new segment uh, called Speed Dating with an Author. So you and I are going to go on our very romantic date. I have lit a candle for us where we're ready. So my first question for you is, what are one of the clumsiest moments you've ever had? Physically or socially? <laughs> either or both oh gosh let's see socially I would probably say for me it actually was like a teaching moment it was a last minute thing for class um a, this class that we were having um it was for loans retirement loans that I had to give a class on and I knew some I was in new in that department so I'm still learning some of the loan stuff and they're like, you need to teach it. And I'm like, I just got here. How am I supposed to teach something I don't know about? And then I walked into the class, you know, people, you could, it was a large auditorium and people were waiting in their chairs and I walked in and I slammed the edge of my skirt into the door and I was wearing an elastic band skirt. So it sort of like pulled the back of my skirt down a little, I didn't lose it all the way, but I'm sure you know, like the back of the room caught a good shot of my underwear. That's brilliant. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm sure they remembered me, if not necessarily by my talk, then by my underwear. You know how to make me <laughs> That's perfect. You're like, I'm yeah, so. <laughs> How, what three words would you describe yourself as? Uh, let's see. Uh, Goal-oriented, pragmatic, um, uh, disorganized. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what song best describes you? Ah, okay. So I saw that question and I was trying to think what would be the best way to, that would describe me. Okay. <clears throat> so on the surface, the lyrics sound very materialistic, but the singer, you can tell by the way she's singing it and her intent behind it is that she's definitely taking the piss. Okay. And that is Janis Joplin's Mercedes Benz. So that one for sure. I love that. What is your life mm -hmm. motto? Life motto. Uh, oh, adapt. What is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not many people know of? Oh, gosh, <laughs> let's see. Um, I don't know that they're really unique. Uh, and I haven't done it in a long time, but I used to be a competition barrel racer in rodeo. What? <laughs> so I don't know. I don't really possess that skill set anymore just because it's been a long time since I've been on a horse and certainly not in competition, but that was one. Yeah. So I know a it's not like everybody goes barrel racing in competition rodeo. So I guess maybe that would make it a little unique, but it's been a while. So. I'll, I'll accept that. I'll take that one. I love that. Okay, great. <laughs> That's all my questions on our uh, speed dating. I would 
I would say this was a success. I really enjoyed your company and definitely had a laugh. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd go on a second date with you. Thank you so much. Yay. And see, I even wore mascara for this. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a sweater. <laughs> I, I am too. <laughs> Do you have anything else that you want to let viewers know? Um, anything else we need to know? Where do we find you? Uh, let's see. Um, all of my books, of course, are on the typical, you know, retailers that people visit. So that would be, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo. Um, and I've lost you till the very end. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay, can you see me? <laughs> Yay! <Okay. laughs> so, yeah, I'm on all the usual retailers out there. Um, <clears throat> let's see. You can visit my website if you want to at gracedraven.com. Uh, let's see. For 2021, as we mentioned earlier, I've got a novel I'm hoping to get out for probably closer to the end of 2021. And of course, that's actually dependent. That's the Nomos King. That will de be dependent on when Penguin schedules uh, Raven unveiled. And that has to do with uh, non-compete clauses that are in my contract. So, so I'm looking at the Nomos King, uh, the science fiction romance, which is Silk under Anne Sparrow. And of course, the anthologies, which I know in one of them, I'm going to have uh, the second book in the Bonekeeper Chronicles out. That one is going to be called Gaslight Widus, and it's the follow-up from Gaslight Hades. Wow. So, and the other two, I'm not sure. So hopefully, and of course, I will say none of that is written in stone because I am constantly redoing my schedule because disorganization right here. I love how honest you are. At least you know yourself well. You're like, no premises, we'll give it a go. Exactly. I'm going to do my best. But yeah, this, that's one of those ones. I just like, I would rather that, you know, up front <laughs> that it's going to be really fluid. <laughs> that is all my questions. Thank you so much for hopping on today. I've had an absolute ball. I laughed so hard. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun too. And I'm so sorry for the technical hiccups. No, not at all. It made it even more entertaining. I think even after this, I'll be like, can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Exactly. And it's it's odd that this, you know, PC or this laptop here seemed to have a second sense for like, after one, after a question where I'd be like, oh, I don't know. I'd go. <laughs> Your laptop has a personality. <laughs> I can see you. I can't hear you. <laughs> How about Oh. Yeah, we're there. Yay! <laughs> well, that's a nice way of putting it. You say it has a personality. I say it's possessed. So, <laughs> well, I hope it's a personality and it's nothing more. Uh, but let me know how that goes. <laughs> or just get the sledgehammer. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Yep. I am gonna love you and leave you. But thank you so much for hopping on and have a good day. Thank you, Kai. You too. Bye.